With the latest agriculture news from across the state and nation, it's time for the AgNet News Hour from AgNet West. Here's your host, Sabrina Halbertson. Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning on the AgNet News Hour. Coming up later, adapting vegetable, berry, and grapevine production to a variable climate. But we start with this week's Chill Hour report. Here's Brian German. In this week's California Chill Hour report, brought to you by Dormex. Wake up your buds with Dormex. UC Cooperative Extension Orchard Systems Advisor Kat Jarvis Sheehan highlighted some climate projections that will have a significant impact on chill accumulation and what that will mean for walnut and pistachio trees over the next several years. One of the researchers who thinks about this and is great at visualizing and projecting out these changes, he looked at it from a perspective of, okay, if you have one bad chill year out of 10, you can probably weather that storm economically, but we need to know like how much chill we feel comfortable saying you can expect nine out of 10 years. So when we look at the amount of chill you can expect nine out of 10 years, you know, around 2000, we could expect 70 chill portions in that around there, nine out of 10 years. So you could safely say, all right, if I plant a crop that has chill requirement of 60 portions or 65 portions, nine out of 10 years, my tree is going to meet that chill requirement because we are going to get up to 70 nine out of 10 years. So that'll be fine. But then they looked into the future. So If the valley generally gets 70 chill portions, 9 out of 10 years at the turn of the century, what are we expecting for the middle of the century? You know, and and middle of the century feels like a long way away, but that's 2040 to 2060 is the way climate scientists define that. That's 17 years from now. So an orchard you're putting in the ground right now will be in the middle of its prime, pistachio-wise and walnut-wise, hopefully, in that time frame. And we're expecting a decrease in chill of about 15 to 20 percent, depending on where in the valley you are, by 2040. So that's more in the realm of 51 chill portions, nine out of 10 years here in the southern San Joaquin, where we're doing this interview right now, and about 60 chill portions in the Sac Valley in northern San Joaquin, which means if you're growing something like Kerman, which pistachios, which requires 55 to 60 chill portions, at least one out of 10 years, you're not going to hit that mark probably more often than that. So I'd say orchards that are going in the ground right now, young orchards that are coming into bearing about 10 years from now, they're going to be expected to often experience 10 to 15 percent less chill in their prime when they're in that 15th to 20th leaf prime relative to what we have historically considered normal chill accumulation. As researchers continue looking at new varieties to potentially address the lack of chill, Jarvis Sheehan has been working with dormancy-breaking materials like Dormex that can help mitigate some of the challenges related to chill accumulation in the short term. So let's not just be doom and gloom about this. Let's talk about solutions. You know, the trees that are in the ground now, you got to, how's it go? You dance with the one that brung you, right? Like you're stuck with those trees for quite a while. So you can't change that variety or its chilling requirement, but you can apply things to those trees to help compensate in those low chill years. So pistachio growers have some history with horticultural oil, which is not something we use in other tree crops, but to varied degrees of success depending on the year. That's been kind of a hard tool to uh, really get right consistently. There are things that you can apply to the trees that are essentially reflectance. So as we are in these lower fog times, it keeps the branches from heating up as much with the sun bearing down on them during the winter. And then we get into the traditional dormancy breaking chemicals. So we've been looking at various forms of nitrate because CAN-17 is liquid. It's a lot easier to work with than like potassium nitrate. So that's what we've been looking at as a dormancy breaker and erger, which is a cocktail, branded cocktail of nitrogen and then hydrogen cyanamide. And we found all three of those, uh, in walnuts at least, are effective at helping trees wake up from dormancy earlier than they would have without some intervention. And information from the UC Davis Chill Calculator shows that as of February 28th, the Durham Simis Station has logged 70.5 portions under the dynamic model with 917 hours below 45 degrees. The station in Manteca has registered 65.9 portions with 763 hours. There have been 993 hours in Merced with 65.3 cumulative portions. In five points, there have been 807 chill hours, equating to 62.5 portions. 
Finally, the simistation in Shafter has registered 57.9 portions with 786 hours. And this has been another episode of the California Chill Hour Report brought to you by Dormex. You're listening to the Agnet News Hour. In today's national spotlight, one of the best pathways for U.S. grain is no longer hindered by drought. David Geiger has this report. Drought conditions have ended along the Mississippi River, according to the Army Corps of Engineers. Mike Seenhook with the Soy Transportation Coalition points to recent snowfall and rain in the overall watershed working against the prolonged period of declining water levels. And they actually started in September of 2022, so they've been uh, with us for a considerable period of time. So, you know, good to see water levels back to some degree of normalcy. The concern that we have, though, moving forward is that So much of U.S. farm ground is very dehydrated, and so what that means is it won't take a very prolonged period of dry conditions to all of a sudden return us back to low water conditions. That is a concern for one of the largest and most efficient pathways for Midwest farmers to get their grain to market. Steenook thinks the best time to respond to a potential challenge is before it happens. So anything that we can do in terms of water levels, that, that really kind of points to having you know, available dredges that are ready uh, to be deployed if there's going to be problems that that will materialize, not just waiting for the problem to occur, and then all of a sudden you make a plan for addressing it. Infrastructure laws have been passed over the past few years, so funding has been made available to help out waterways like the Mississippi River, but Steenhook says that's come alongside some drama. Supply chains are kind of like your annual wellness exam. The less dramatic it is, the more boring it is, the better it is. You don't want the doctor to come in and say, I've got some really exciting things I want to talk to you about. Ultimately, Steenhook thinks there needs to be a more reliable and predictable form of funding. Not just for the assets themselves, like locks and dams, but then also things like dredging, which is not a very sexy thing, but it is essential to have navigation that's allowed to proceed on our inland waterway system. And the more you can make that predictable, reliable, the better stewardship you're practicing of the taxpayer dollars, the better, the more beneficial it is to the, to those who actually rely on that system. I'm David Geiger reporting. 2023 could bring another downturn in U.S. agricultural exports. Gary Crawford has more. A better 2024 ag export forecast than was expected three months ago, but still USDA is projecting exports this year to come in at $170.5 billion, down about $8 billion below fiscal 23. And so that would be a 5% decrease from 23 to 24 if this forecast were realized. USDA economist Bart Kenner says to explain the downturn, you've got the usual suspects first a continued strong dollar. And that creates uh, opportunity for other competing countries to sell their comparable products at a lower price. That brings us to reason two, stiff crop production competition. From other countries like Brazil and Argentina, who are uh, producing a lot of the bulk products that tend to drive the export values that we see. Especially for corn and soybeans. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Several key winter wheat production states note condition improvements throughout the course of the winter, as reflected in USDA's latest State Stories report. Here's Rod Bain. What does winter wheat crop conditions look like as a whole among states reporting to USDA this time of year? USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says within the end of February edition of the Agriculture Department State Stories report. We have had a relatively easy winter. The crop, generally speaking, has seen improved moisture since planting. And other than a cold outbreak that hit in mid-January, we have escaped significant weather challenges that could have hurt the crop. What that means on a state level includes conditions in our number one production state improving. Kansas, which went into this winter, which is 32% of the winter wheat rated in good to excellent condition, now coming in at 57% good to excellent. At the same time, Kansas wheat rated very poor to poor was 32% near the end of November. That has since dropped to 13%. Rippy adds similar condition trend improvements are noted for winter wheat throughout the winter in the Great Plains and Midwest. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. That's today's National Spotlight. Now here's Will Jordan with the Livestock Report. In today's Livestock News, a highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak persists among wild birds. 
United States Department of Agriculture Chief Veterinarian Rosemary Sifford discusses some of the concerns associated with the ongoing issue. We are still seeing detections in the wild birds. While the numbers are lower, they're still there. And so I would expect that as long as the migration comes back, at this point it seems like they're going to be carrying the virus. So I think we should be prepared for that as we move into the spring. There's a lot of work going on around what's going on with this virus and how is it persisting in the wild birds. Hopefully we'll learn more from that work and be able to use that to inform our procedures. I think we We've seen our surges and we've seen the troughs over the last couple of years in the October, November, early December time frame. We saw another surge. We are still very consistently seeing that the surges are associated mostly with direct introductions from wild birds and it's when you have wild birds in your neighborhood. But we do have to really keep our watch up. I think in some cases we're seeing a little bit of fatigue and we're all tired of this now, but it's really, really important that we keep the message up that biosecurity is still supremely important, particularly if there are wild birds in your neighborhood. USDA emphasizes the seriousness of HPAI as a contagious disease. Their goal is to eradicate the disease in order to protect the poultry industry and American consumers. In other livestock news, mitigating risk is vital in today's business climate. Farming is no different. Dairy margin coverage enrollment opened yesterday, and the American Farm Bureau Federation is encouraging dairy producers to enroll in the risk management program. Michael Clements shares more. The Department of Agriculture this week opens the Dairy Margin Coverage Program enrollment period for 2024. American Farm Bureau Federation economist Danny Munch says the program helps dairy producers manage risk. Dairy margin coverage, often called DMC, provides a level of risk management protection to dairy farmers under low margin conditions. So that can be caused by low milk prices, high feed costs, or a combination of both. To participate in dairy margin coverage, dairy producers select a coverage level ranging from $4 to $9.50 per hundredweight on 50 cent increase. And then they select a coverage level for their production history, ranging from 5% to 95% of their coverage history. The enrollment period starts Wednesday, February 28th. Enrollment for the year, which traditionally opens in October, has been delayed up until this point. FSA originally reported delays for software updates, as well as the need to publish a new rule related to production history as the reason why there were delays. AFBF sent a letter urging FSA to open enrollment back on February 6th. Sign up or dairy margin coverage will end April 29th. And the good news is there will be retroactive coverage and payments for those who sign up quickly. Munch says that while opening DMC enrollment helps, AFBF is still seeking larger changes to how dairy farmers are paid. Michael Clements, Washington. I'm Will Jordan for Agnet West. This is the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson and we will be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Coming up in a few moments, we'll have today's This Land of Ours report, but first, more of the day's agriculture news. And with today's Agnet West headlines, here's Agnet West Farm News Director Brian German. Researchers are looking to develop equipment to give pistachio growers more detailed harvest information. Nut crops breeder at UC Davis, Pat Brown, said there's two technologies they're looking at for yield monitoring. One of them was a ground-based vehicle that goes through and takes pictures and counts nuts in pictures. And so you can run that anytime during the season after, you know, the nut has expanded to full size. You can run it probably beginning in early July. The other one attaches to the actual harvester. And so that is taking a volumetric sort of measurement after the blanks have been blown off. So when you're taking pictures of nuts on the tree, you don't know what's blank and what's not. Then after harvest, obviously you can blow the blanks off and estimate the remaining volume. So we think that both of those tools together are going to be useful along, obviously, with the the actual yield measurement. Director of Agriculture Business Development for the Propane Education and Research Council, Mike Newland, said interest continues to grow in the use of propane on the farm. The irrigation conversation is one that we always have. The biggest source of energy for irrigation is electricity, but propane's growing every single year, and we're doing that through messaging, through education. We've got an incentive program to help folks who maybe want to switch from a different source of irrigation to propane irrigation, so a grower could get uh, checked back directly directly from our organization when you do install a an, an propane irrigation motor. So there's some reasons it's doing it that we're growing every single year. So the fuel's abundant. We've got a lot of propane in the country. You know, all the natural gas production that goes on in the U.S., all that produces propane. And we're burning about 40% of what we could be burning in the U.S., so we've got a lot of it. We're exporting the rest of that to other countries just to make sure that we can keep those natural gas plants running because that's, that's the critical piece 
piece in the whole component is we got to make sure we've got natural gas for all the power generation plants and uh, we're producing more and more propane every single month and every single year so we've got a lot of fuel the good thing is for the ag community we've got 800,000 farms that use propane today across our country they're used to the fuel so I don't have to convince them of what it is that it's safe that it's clean because they're used to doing it they're either running their forklifts on the farm with it they're drying grain with it uh, depending on where you're at in the country those are the biggest uses of it on the farm Uh, heating shops you know that's the one I guess I shouldn't forget about because we uh, heat hog buildings chicken buildings turkey buildings all across the country with our fuel so people are used to it they're used to being around it they know it's safe they know it's clean and these are just new uses new ways of looking at agriculture and we've got some things that we think can help a lot of farmers around the country More than $770 million is being invested in infrastructure to benefit more than 1 million people across rural communities. The USDA is funding 216 projects with a focus on high-speed Internet, clean water, infrastructure, and economic growth. Nearly $52 million will help expand access to high-speed Internet for people in rural areas through the ReConnect program and the Broadband Technical Assistance program. Nearly $77 million will be used for projects in underserved communities participating in the Rural Partners Network. USDA is also awarding more than $644 million to help nearly 160 rural utilities provide clean drinking water and sanitary wastewater systems. These projects, totaling $772.6 million, aim to provide reliable Internet access, clean water, and support for rural families, agricultural producers, and small businesses. Periodic testing requirements of the Clean Truck Check program will begin this summer. Director of Regulatory and Environmental Affairs for Western United Dairies, Paul Souza, said industry members will need to have their information entered into the California Air Resources Board's database before compliance testing begins. The smog check is supposed to start July 1st of 2024, depending on when your registration is due, would be the first smog check. So when you go into that database, there's a little checkbox for agricultural truck. If you do have an ag truck that's doing work in ag or taking ag products to the first point of processing, you need to check that box. It's going to be one time per year smog checking and so it's all getting set up and getting built but getting that stuff in the database is the first piece and then starting the smogs and I'll put more out there information for folks that want it once that becomes a thing and letting folks know when you need to get your truck smog I'll be doing that in the second half of this year so folks can keep up with that. A Monterey County Climate Smart Ag Workshop is coming up next week. The workshop on adapting vegetable, berry, and grapevine production to a changing and variable climate on the Central Coast is coming up March 6th at the Monterey County Cooperative Extension Office in Salinas. The first session of the day highlights climate impacts on agricultural pests and impacts on specialty crops in the Central Coast and will also include a grower panel discussion on production challenges. The second session will go over tools and resources for climate smart agriculture, including the CDFA Climate Smart Ag Web Repository and CalAgro Climate Decision Support Tools. The final session will focus on case studies on regional adaptation practices, highlighting rootstocks and varieties for wine grapes, protecting water quality in vegetable systems, and weather and climate effects on berry production. More information on the workshop is available on the upcoming events page at agnetwest.com. I'm Brian German for Agnet West Radio Network. I am at Commodity Classic in Houston, Texas this week, and I stopped by the NASA booth to learn about some of their programs. Here are my conversations. My name is Tina Hart Ballinger. I am with NASA Goddard, and I am also a contractor through SSAI. I work in STEM engagement and outreach. We are here at Commodity Classic where you're going to be talking with a lot of people and you're talking about the GLOBE uh, project program today. So tell me, what is the GLOBE program? The GLOBE program was established 30 years ago. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary this year on Earth Day. Um, and so 1994, the GLOBE program was established. It is sponsored by NASA, and it is funded in part by NSF, NOAA, and the Department of State. And the GLOBE program, GLOBE stands for global learning and observation to benefit the environment. And so we've connected educators and students with NASA scientists and the various Earth missions, and we engage students in actually going outside and collecting Earth data Uh, and learning about the various components of the missions and how they can be part of that. 
where are the students from? We are in 127 countries around the world, so it is an international program. Um, I work specifically with the informal side of GLOBE, and I work with camps and informal learning centers, uh, doing summer camps and camp-to-school partnerships through the year. And so the project that I work on specifically is NASA GLOBE Goes to Camp. And so we have summer camps, and uh, they also engage with after-school programs, field investigations, workplace development, trying to um, encourage and build the skills for data literate citizens to help. And so the ag focus would be related to soil moisture and surface temperature and aerosols and a variety of pr data protocols that benefit the ag community. I want to ask about the importance of being data literate, which first off is not a term that I have heard before speaking with you, but now that I have heard it, it actually it makes so much sense. But let's talk about why is it important that we're teaching students to get to help them become data literate? Well, it's beneficial for the, the student to begin to develop those skills. Uh, when they're able to collect their own data, they be, develop a better understanding of what data is. Then when you share with them the data that NASA is collecting that is also aligned with what they're doing, they begin to have the resources and the skills developed to make better informed decisions. And as as farmers and the various things that we face with natural disasters and so many things that are going on around us, enabling them to have access to the data to make those informed decisions is just going to benefit us all. So for somebody who's hearing this and would really like to get more information, where can they find that? Well, the GLOBE program is very simple. You can find the GLOBE program at globe.gov. Is there anything else that you'd like for our listeners to know? If we really want to be working towards the future of ag and building what needs to be to make the changes necessary to get us from where we are today to then, we really need to be concentrating on the um, students that are going to be the future leaders of, of what's going on in ag. So I feel like that it's never too early to start with the students and to get them engaged uh, because they have such a natural curiosity and a lot of times we overlook the benefits of that and we want to foster that and encourage that. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for being out here at Commodity Classic. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Elizabeth Joyner, Community Coordinator for NASA's Earth Science Data Systems Program. All right, that has a really long title to it, the, the name of your program. What is your program? So our program is out of headquarters and we feature various projects that are all centered around remote sensing, earth observation, data collection, and making those data accessible and usable by the, our stakeholders. So what kind of data is collected? So we have all kinds of data. We've got satellite data, we have airborne campaign data, field data, in situ data, we have citizen science data, we have all kinds of data and petabytes of data. And what? Petabytes, that's a measurement of, of data volume. Lots, big data, big data, yeah, it's big data, yeah. So tell me about the importance of and why does this matter to farmers let's um, you know bringing it down to our listeners level why is this important to them that this program is there and that it keeps going so our data are freely and openly available to all users. And so these data are earth observation data. So the kinds of data that may be of interest to uh, farmers and those in the agriculture fields, uh, professional fields, um, include things like soil moisture, evapotranspiration data, precipitation data. We have uh, runoff data. We have uh, uh, digital elevation models that all can be freely and openly accessed accessed and used by the by the farmer stakeholder group. The fact that it can be just freely used is I think it's very important that people know that this is available and that they you know they don't have to pay for it, they don't have to have a subscription to something. They can just find it. So where do they find it? So we find you can find all of our data at earthdata.nasa.gov, and you will find the big repository of our data there. There are various tools, resources, uh, articles, um, use cases, all kinds of different tools to help people get started with data, no matter where they fall in terms 
terms of the, uh, their data literacy, their data dexterity, their data fluency. We have different resources that help users connect with our data in a lot of different ways. So that's amazing. So somebody who is new to um, accessing this type of data or you know, to looking at various aspects of, uh, let's say soil moisture. So this will help them at their, meet them at their level so that they can start um, understanding the data that they're consuming. That's correct. So we have, um, for those that are new to our data, we, we have these resources, I'm going to grab this one here, um, called our Data Pathfinders. And this one was recently updated for the Commodity Classic last year. And this includes, and this one's called the Agriculture and Water Management Data Pathfinder. It includes commonly referred to data sets, trainings from NASA that connect people uh, directly and learning from subject matter experts experts who are working with farmers for, let's say, with uh, soil moisture data. And um, uh, uh, let's see here, we have water availability data in this Pathfinder, weather, extreme events, and seasonal and subseasonal growing projections. We have nutrient management and uh, soil conservation and sustainable practices, and all uh, data that helps support those different applications. I'm surprised that I have I did not know this and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who still don't know this that there is just so much available that you know if we need to know something especially you know on your farm if you need to know something it is right there and you can access it you can access it and um, use it how you need to. That's right. So we are here for you. Um, again, go to earthdata.nasa.gov. Uh, we have a variety of different pathways to enter into our data and use our data. And we would love to support farmers in their use and making action, action of our data. We will be back in just a moment with more agriculture news. Welcome back to the Agnet News Hour. We continue from Commodity Classic in Houston, Texas, where I stopped by the FMC booth and chatted with an expert on almonds and alfalfa. I'm Eric Castro. I'm the regional technical manager for FMC and cover the Western U.S. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about almonds. What should almond growers be thinking about right now? Well, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is last year and, and just the, kind of the lessons we learned and we kind of paid the price on damage. And that goes back to our sanitation sprays. And if you remember last year with all the weather, all the challenges to get in the orchards, we didn't do a good job as an industry on sanitation sprays. And so that really translated and, 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 and snowballed through the season. And at the end of the season, when you're getting paid on, on quality, you saw the damage that, that we had, you know, very high levels of damage, and we just got behind early. So that's probably the biggest thing going into 24. And I think even, you know, with almond prices down, the importance of management, regardless of the price, is critical and so to, to kick off and you know to take care of mummy sprays and those may sprays and get it get to get to stage set for success for the rest of the year because we learned that lesson last year and it wasn't a good one you know we do talk a lot about the importance of sanitation uh, I wonder what it was that this last year that just you know made like you said kind of across the industry got a little lax you know, I really think that it wasn't a, you know, necessarily a grower or PCA choice. It was the hand we were dealt because it was the weather. If you recall that it was so wet and, and we couldn't get in, you know, and, and make those sprays. And so we were against the, you know, just against the wall. And so, you know, whether it was a conscious decision or not, it was probably more of the hand we were dealt and just realized, uh, you know, afterwards how important it is to figure out how to, to take care of that. You're right, you're right. We did have that weather. And, and speaking of weather, the weather continues uh, to, you know, to deal a hand that's not so pleasant sometimes. So what to do now? Well, I mean, I think there's always opportunity with rainfall. So, you know, I'm really hesitant to ever, you know, criticize or be, you know, or not, uh, or, or to think negative, negatively about the rainfall. But, you know, in California is so diverse. And so there's so many different opportunities. Um, and I know that, that a lot of the, the growers are locked into their crops, especially permanent crops. But for those that had more flexibility, say tomatoes last year, there was a, a great opportunity because of the moisture. You know, and you look now, last year was a down year for rice just because of water management. And now this year, you feel rice coming back. So there's always opportunity with water. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, the downside can be some of the inconveniences and not being able to get in and make timely applications. But 
that just to me stresses the importance of, of trying to figure out how you can do it even though it may not be the way you've done it in the past. Yeah, and, and you're right, and especially with water just being so important, you know, everywhere, but I'm going to say especially in California. How important is it to have a plan and maybe even a backup plan if things, you know, if the weather is not cooperating with your original plan? No, I think it's absolutely critical, and, and you know, with FMC is one of the things that we've done that, that kind of fits into that plan is our Avant Evo that's in that May spray window prior to May 15th, and so... We have a solution um, for those overwintering and the mummies and, and so that may spray. And the, the trick there, the key to it is don't do something in that window that creates a problem later. And the uniqueness of what we're doing there is we, we don't have a pyrethroid. We don't have anything in that, in that uh, with a Bon Evo that can flare other pests. So we're, we're going in and controlling uh, the plant bugs and other, in, you know, not only just the navel orange worm, but other species that allows you to get off on a, a good start and then roll into, uh, you know, the, the standard in the industry for navel orange worm, which is Altacor Evo. So we've really worked to, to provide tools for, you know, for the, the producers and the PCAs that, that, that put together a program that, that matches up with their needs early, that helps overcome, you know, maybe if you weren't able to get in and do uh, mechanical sanitation and how we have a tool that helps with that and gets you off to a good start. Anything else you want to talk about with almonds? You know, not, that, those are the big issues, I think, right now uh, that are hidden, yeah. How about if we talk a little bit about alfalfa? Anything we should know about that? Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's a, you know, alfalfa is unique, you know, and, and the thing about alfalfa, it's kind of like almonds, you know, that there's a pest that's predictable. You know, the alfalfa weevil is predictable because uh, it's, it, it is based off temperature and, and there's, you can predict when that's going to happen a lot of times. Last year, it was kind of unique across the country that the pest, the, the, the temperatures were there, but the alfalfa growth didn't coincide. And that's very challenging because a lot of the products we're using are, it, it has to do with ingestion and, and having a, a stand there that, um, you know, so that the, the pest can consume, because most of these are um, uh, ingestion type. Uh, insecticides. So that was a challenge. It kind of the pest was there and gone before you had the opportunity to really uh, use your most effective treatments. You know, the the other thing that's going on in, the, in, in just alfalfa in general is a recognition of resistance with especially the pyrethroids. They've been the go-to. We've lost Lord's Band, you know, temporarily. And uh, we use steward insecticide to manage weevils and other lap pests. And so with its work out of Montana State, some great work that's being done there. There's some great work being done with Michael Retzwitz and, and then others in California and in Arizona, but the recognition that, that resistance is a real issue. And, and so to understand that and to have a management strategy that recognizes that even though something may be more economical if it doesn't work, it's, it, it's not, you know, it's not, um, the return is not there. And so, you know, we're hoping this year as the pest and the, uh, the temperatures and the alfalfa growth and all that lines up, they're real, really um, able to, you know, to, to utilize Stuart Evo to provide best in class on, on uh, alfalfa weevil control and then also the return on investment from those applications. So we're excited about that. And that goes from, you know, Oklahoma all the way to the West Coast and all the way up the, you know, the PNW. So, um, so that's, that's probably the biggest thing that's going on there and the, the recognition, the resistance, and kind of the year we were dealt last year. Yeah. You know, again, dealing with uh, just what the, the hand that's dealt you again, yeah, yeah. you know, not to keep using cards as a reference, but, yeah, and, and making sure that you have the plans that you, that you need and everything is ready to go. No, absolutely. I mean, and that's, you know, and that's kind of agriculture, yeah. you know, and, and it, it, you know, you have the best laid plans and then you have to adjust. And, yeah. and the thing about, you know, the, the, the team that I lead is the tech service team for the West. And so we're about supporting our products technically. And so when the, when, the, you know, maybe the, the climate changes or, you know, the problem shifts, then we're able to, to be there and, and, and support our products with, with recommendations. So it's a, it's a fun place to be. Me personally, I like the up close to the grower and the PCA so that we can react to the, the challenges. And so we have the portfolio to do that. So it's a fun place for me personally to, to, 
to be and to, and to work. How important is that to have that human connection and, and for to have a team that's able to get in there and really give the good advice? Oh, it's, it's you know, it's to me as a, a people leader, it's it's probably the number one is is not only, you know, we're in a relationship business and, and just agriculture and, and you got to have confidence in who's who's making those recommendations. And, and so there's that piece of it. But within the team, it's just critical to have that trust and to push each other. And, and so if you look at the team in the West, you know, I've been in the industry for some time and it's absolutely the best team that and just to see. Um, just how they work together and just the response that whether it's PCA to the growers and, and they see not only the technical expertise but the passion for agriculture and that's not something that you know you're it's not something you develop you're kind of born with that passion so it's fun to put a team together that everybody's passionate and the other thing about the team I lead there couldn't be any more different so it, that's fun too to see the diversity on the team to get in a whether it's in a room or at a meeting, and just see the, the ideas and just, um, you know, just what comes from that. So uh, if you run across FMC in the West, I'm not, you'll be impressed wherever you land. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Dairy farmers now have the chance to sign up for the Dairy Margin Coverage Program. Chad Smith has more. Chris Galen. Senior Vice President of Member Services and Governance with the National Milk Producers Federation says DMC is a big improvement over past dairy support programs. We decided about 10 years ago to work with Congress to come up with something better, something that isn't just tied to the price of milk, that doesn't involve the USDA coming into the market that way as a buyer of last resort, and actually coming up with a system that is modeled somewhat after crop insurance, where it's a type of economic insurance. You basically know going in kind of what a good milk price is and what a good margin is. This program allows you then to buy different levels of coverage from low to high. You have to pay more for higher coverage, obviously, but it's just like any other form of insurance. It allows you to cover your bottom line against bad conditions, either caused by low milk prices or by high feed costs. He says margins for dairy farmers are better than they were six to nine months ago, but don't let that keep you from signing up. Margins were so throughout much of 2023 that even right now things are just kind of mediocre. At the end of last year we just got the numbers for the month of December. If you signed up at the highest coverage level which is nine dollars and fifty cents per hundredweight you would have gotten a payment for the month of December if you were covered for 2023. Margins in that case were not terrible but certainly not great. The forecast is for better conditions not great conditions but certainly improved conditions in 2024. But we have to see if that's going to be the case. So that's why we encourage people to look at the dairy margin coverage program if they're not already covered or to make adjustments in their coverage levels because you just don't know what's going to happen with either milk prices or feed costs. The only cost is a $100 non-refundable administrative fee, although the premiums rise for higher levels of coverage. Other than that, the program is open to any dairy operation in the U.S. It's open to anyone who commercially sells milk. A lot of farms have already locked in their coverage for this year because of a multi-year lock-in contract that they could have enrolled in a few years ago. Now, that contract was supposed to end last year with the expiration of the Farm Bill, but because Congress kicked the can down the road into 2024 and extended the Farm Bill, that also means that those enrolled in the multi-year contracts are eligible for their continued discounted rates this year. Chad Smith reporting. That's today's Top Agriculture News. I'm Sabrina Halverson. Thank you for sharing your morning with us. To get more information on the topics you heard today, visit Agnet West online at agnetwest.com. You can also stay connected by following us on our social media at Agnet West on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also find our broadcast team of Brian German and Sabrina Halverson on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for listening to the Agnet News Hour from Agnet West. Agnet West Radio Network, your primary choice for agriculture news.